Hi, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle with a very brief introduction to the bank balance sheet. In this case, a stylized example of a depository institution. This is in response to a customer question. And what I really want to get to is showing you the three of the different ratios that we're reading about a lot in regard to bank uh, capital adequacy, leverage ratios, and the tier one capital ratios. So first, in regard to the bank's balance sheet, it's similar to a non-financial corporation in the sense that we have assets on the left and they need to equal liabilities plus equity on the right. Other than that, it's harder to analyze a bank balance sheet, largely because of the complexity here on the right-hand side. Various instruments are used to as pr providing sources of funds to the bank. But if we look on the assets here on the left, we'll see sorted by liquidity, secur securities and short-term investments, many of which would constitute the bank's trading book as opposed to its banking book. And then because this is a stylized example of a depository institution, the bank is going to be in the business of making loans to customers. And you'll notice extending loans to customers constitutes an asset for the bank. So this could be business and consumer loans and mortgages. So in my example, total gross loans here is 500. And then an important line item here, loan loss reserves. The bank has $500 in credit extended to customers. However, that's a credit portfolio from which bank, the bank does not expect all of the loans to be 100% repaid. It does expect some defaults. These are expected losses. The expected losses are priced into the yield of those loans and they are counted for, provisioned for, as loan loss reserves. So this is where management has used the discretion to say, of this 500, we expect to not recover 10%. That's the credit risk that manifests as defaults on the loan. And as a, as a management discretion item, it can be used to smooth earnings. So the 500 gross minus management's estimate of expected losses, 50, equals 450 in net loans, which are assets to the bank. Now the expected loans are covered by the loan loss reserves, but not the unexpected losses. I'm sorry, expected losses are covered by loan loss reserves, but not the unexpected losses. Unexpected losses are covered by capital buffer, including the regulatory capital requirements under Basel II. So just to finish up the asset side, 450 in net loans plus some other assets including goodwill, and we have $1,000 in assets under my stylized example. What I also have here are off, if I go over here to the left, off balance sheet instruments. So these are not showing up, they're not being booked with a, a carrying amount on the balance sheet. These would typically include derivatives forwards and futures, options, swaps, and credit derivatives like the infamous credit default swap that might be off balance sheet. So I'll say the value of those off balance sheet instruments is $250. Because those off balance sheet, while they may not show up in the carrying amount for total assets, they will contribute to the regulatory ratio that includes risk weighted assets. Since these off balance sheet instruments do constitute contingent exposure. So now if we look at liabilities and equity, starting here from the top, this is a depository institution, so it's going to be funded by customer deposits. So you'll notice the bank is playing both sides of the balance sheet. Customers over here it extends loans to, those are assets. Deposits it accepts from customers, and so those are liabilities. Then it's also typically going to have debt funding. Those are These are the investors. And there's a pecking order, senior debt, subordinate or junior debt. And also some of this debt may be secured by collateral, which is safer to investors and therefore is going to pay a lower yield, but maybe unsecured debt that is not backed by collateral. So in my case, we have senior secured, senior unsecured, subordinated term debt, such that the total of debt plus loans is 550. And then let's just say this bank has some hybrid instruments like convertible bonds. These are bonds that have embedded options to convert into equity. So that, let's say of 100, add deposits plus debt plus loan plus the convertibles, and our liability here is $950. And immediately, this is a key characteristic of a bank. It's highly leveraged. 
total assets of 1000 total liabilities of 950 meaning there's really only $50 in core capital. Core capital here is preferred shares and shareholders equity. Preferred shares have characteristics of the debt. They typically or may pay a dividend but do not vote. But they're lowest here in the pecking order, right above the shareholders' equity. The shareholders here who have the residual claim, so they only have what's remaining. So the high leverage feature can just be illustrated here if we take the gross loans and the 500 the 500 in value loans goes down to just say 450 then the shareholders under this highly leveraged bank are immediately wiped out so that's the the leverage aspect the other thing is that the spread is very important to the bank over here we have credit sensitive assets that are earning interest for the bank these are the revenues and they are funded here in by deposits and also debt instruments that are an interest expense to the bank. So the spread between these two has a lot to do with the bank's profitability. Here's the here's return on assets, here's cost of funds. The spread helps them determine their profitability. So finally, let's just briefly look at three ratios that we've been reading about a lot. Core capital or leverage ratio. So this really comes right off the balance sheet. And in this case, we have core capital here of $50. That's the common equity, the shareholders that have the residual claim, plus probably the preferred shares. Or it depends. There's flavors of preferred share. But I'll include those. That's $50 in core capital divided by the total assets of 1,000. Gives us a 5% core capital ratio or leverage for the bank. Now, how about these two ratios here that really come from the Basel regulations, risk-based tier one capital ratio? Well, for tier one, the capital here is the same. It's core capital, which includes shareholders, equity, and preferred share, and we'll call that tier one. So it's buffer of the highest quality. It is, it is ready and available to absorb losses, credit losses over here. So $50, same numerator. But now the difference here is instead of dividing by the book value of the assets here, what's carried on the balance sheet, the assets are risk weighted. So that was a key idea with the regulation. We want the assets to reflect their true risk characteristics. So in this case, in my simplified example, two differences. I've added the off balance sheet assets back here to count because they are contingent exposures and then also just a little bit of a multiplier let's say these assets are risky and so they're plussed up in this case just to simplify I have risk weighted assets of 1500 so my tier one then is core capital divided by my risk weighted assets of 1500 so when I adjust for risk my ratio doesn't look quite so good. Tier one ratio here of 3.3%. It's below what the bank usually needs to have of about 4% or more. And then finally, tier one plus two ratio, this ratio in the numerator, this is the buffer that can be used to absorb losses, can include the hybrids and then the subordinated germ term debt. So some of these other instruments are available to absorb losses. So tier one plus two is available, there's more buffer, and that gets divided by the risk weighted assets and gives us here a tier one plus two regulatory risk base ratio of 16.7%. So there's many details that go into the specific calculations, but this gives you a general sense. This is David Harper, The Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.